My guest today is Brian Potter. Brian is a licensed structural engineer with 10 years of experience in the construction industry. And I have him on the show today because he worked at Katera, the construction industry startup that uh, was outside funded with a bunch of Silicon Valley money and was attempting to vertically integrate the construction industry and went bankrupt just a few months ago. We're recording this in 2021. So he worked with uh, Katera for almost three years. He has deep insider knowledge into the uh, successes and the failures of the organization. The purpose of this episode today is not to bash Katera. They took on a tough challenge in the construction industry. Um, they didn't get it right, at least this iteration of it. But we want to explore what they did get right, what they did get wrong, why it's so difficult to integrate the construction industry from the top to the bottom, so to speak, from design and supply and engineering and construction, what the challenges are that are being faced, and perhaps how someone could do things differently the next time they try a vertical integration in the industry. So, like I always say, enjoy my conversation with Brian. He has a killer recommendation, by the way, at the end for a barbecue joint in Atlanta. And you can go to the show notes and there's a bunch of links there that go to his blog, which is Construction Physics. You should check it out. He's got a, a lot of good um, articles there around the construction industry. I'm going to have him back on the show um, in the future as well to talk about things like 3D printing and efficiency in construction. And so I know you'll enjoy my conversation today with Brian. And as always, thank you for listening to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Brian, welcome to Construction Genius. Hi. You know, um, I'm so glad to have you on the show. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Katera. And um, tell me a little bit about your experience with Katera. Sure. Uh, yeah, I joined in Katera in uh, early 2018. I was the uh, one of the early engineering hires, and I was hired to sort of uh, help build and, and then manage the uh, Atlanta Structural Engineering Office. And then I did that for the next two and a half years and, and until I left the until I left the company um, a few months before it uh, went bankrupt. Okay. And you just for the audience out there, there's going to be links in the show notes. If you have never heard of Katera here on the West coast, where I'm from, everyone's heard of Katera because it was a sort of a combination of a construction and a, and a high tech startup. And it's really interesting in the construction industry. My sense of it has been is that half of the folks who are looking at Katera from the outside are skeptic. were skeptical. Half of them are really hopeful. And there was sort of this combination of people hoping they fail and people hoping they succeed. What was your impression of it, Brian? Yeah. I mean, in those early years, I think that's, that's definitely true that we had a lot of tailwinds about people really excited about the potential. You know, there's a lot of sense, I think, in the industry and then elsewhere that construction can be done a lot better than it's been. And then here was a company that came along that was promising to, to do it better and had a giant war chest that to fund that attempt. And so, yeah, there was a lot of enthusiasm about it. And then, yeah, there was definitely folks that had thought they didn't know what they're doing, thought here's another startup that is going to run by outsiders and they're going to not know the lessons of the industry and they're not going to be able to do what they say they're going to do. So there was definitely, yeah, I would say those those two feelings about the about the company. It's interesting because Katera was launched in 2015 by an industry outsider. Who was the original CEO? Uh, the original CEO is a, a man named Michael Marks, I believe, uh, who is a former electronics contract manufacturer executive. And I guess the mindset that he has or had was that he could bring his expertise in supply chain and, and other aspects of business and try and 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 take on the the big behemoth of the construction industry and rationalize the whole you know uh, ten trillion dollar construction industry and and try and do things differently. Yeah, as as I understand it, that was the thesis that you know here we can take these lessons of of of, of manufacturing and, and and best practices and use those to change how the construction industry is done, which is done by you know, a series of one off projects that are built manually on site 
everything is designed uh, from scratch every single time. Everything is built from scratch every single time. There's no repetitiveness. There's no economies of scale. And the thinking was that's a, a huge opportunity for somebody that has you know the right logistics and manufacturing expertise. Yeah, it's interesting because construction, we all know, is it's local, it's personal, it's custom, and that creates um, a whole bunch of advantages, but it also creates a whole bunch of inefficiencies and cost overruns, schedule overruns. And, and I guess that's really what Katera was, was focused on and, and wanting to address. Yeah. The, you know, the, the sort of talking point that, that guy tried out a lot was the comparison with cars where, you know, your, your car is, is not built by hand. Uh, it was at one time, you know, a hundred years ago, but now we build them in factories and because we build them in factories and we can build them so efficiently that allows everyone to afford one that, to some extent, uh, who wants one. And the idea was to bring that efficiency in, into construction. And then, you know, the further comparison with cars was like, you know, like a car, uh, we would have a ton of different product offerings, a lot of different customizations that would all be built on kind of around the same basic chassis. So yeah, that was kind of, yeah, to try to rationalize that construction and to try to bring the, the economies of scale and bring down that cost. And that was the attempt. You know, it's really interesting. You bring up the car analogy, because like you said, when, when the car industry first got started, cars were hand built, they were custom built. And then they went to sort of the Ford model where where they try to do everything in-house uh, along the assembly line. And, and now the car industry is one where, where obviously they have these car assembly lines, but there's a lot of satellite companies surrounding the car industry that feeds it in order for them to produce a car. And it seems like what Katera was doing was kind of going to that Ford model where every, you know, the original Ford model where everything would be done in-house. Is that the idea there, do you think? Yeah, it was, it was definitely a very highly vertically integrated company where, you know, Katera would do the the design and the engineering and the architecture and be the general contractor and then you know take it to the next step where they were the manufacturer of just not the structure but also all the materials and finishes that were going inside it the light bulbs dishwasher the appliances all that stuff would all be Katera brand it wouldn't you know it might be a, a you know a factory somewhere else that would just put the Katera brand on it where they're building, you know, a thousand appliances and they're putting different brands in every single one. But the idea was that it would be a single source for just about everything that went into the building. Yeah, it's interesting because over the years, they attracted a, a bunch of outside investments. SoftBank invested $2 million in the company uh, between 2018 and 2020. And, you know, if you figure out that the Katera was in business for, um, you know, about six years in operations, that's spending nearly a million dollars a day, seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a massive scale for, for sure. Um, so tell so tell me. I mean, you you worked there for a number of years. I, I know I read your article. I'm going to be linking to that in the show notes, and I can sense from the the article that there's sort of a, a bittersweetness that you have about the time that you spent at Katera. For sure. Uh, like I said, when I in like I say in the article, when I joined, I was you know I was really really excited. I thought it was an amazing opportunity, and I still think the opportunity that they're tackling is really important. That's somebody needs to try to solve. And yeah, I thought kind of, you know, I had been around in the industry in, in kind of a bunch of different roles. I had worked as a design at a design builder and as a consultant engineer and at a sort of a, a subcontractor material supplier. And I kind of seen it from all sides. And I just, you know, I did just the sense that this, you know, the, the way things are done is just so inefficient. There's got to be a better way of doing it, but it's so spread out. And it's so involved in like, there's so many different little things that that combine to make it efficient that somebody, it's going to take a massive effort and to, to change all of that all at once. And I, so then I heard about this company that was trying to change it and also had, was, was trying to change every single thing at once and, had, and hadn't seemed like it had the funds to do it. I thought it was an amazing chance. And I was, I really was, I, I really was excited to be able to take part in it. That's excellent. What do you think? as you reflect on it, were the fatal flaws in the birth of the company that really haunted it throughout its history? Sure. Yeah. There's this kind of idea in startups that you need to kind of find product market fit, which is where you have a product that people are really interested in, that is solving some problem for some key group of people in a way that nothing else out there can do. And even if it's very small that you have honed in on something that is very important. And then once you have that product market fit, once you have something that's working and that you're selling to people that they want to buy, then you kind of scale up that effort. And a lot of problems in, in startups come if the scaling precedes the product market fit and you scale up your company before you have really honed in on exactly what it is you're selling and who you're selling it to and what problem it is 
that you're solving. Um, I'm not an expert in startups uh, by any means, but as I understand it, that's a very common failure mode in startups is that they scale up before they know what it is that they're doing. And then once you've scaled up and you need to change what you're trying to do, it's really hard. You have, you know, so many more people that you're trying to move to, to change focus and processes that you're trying to adjust. And it's, you know, if it's, if that's hard in, in software development, it's 10 times as hard in, if you're moving physical things around where you've built factories and you've acquired materials and, and all that stuff exists in specific places in the world, you can't just pick it up and, and move it. And I think that's kind of, you know, I think that's a, a kind of fundamental issue where they, they, they sort of scaled up before they knew their sort of idea was, was working and when they needed to change or make adjustments to it, which of course any early stage company is, or any startup is, is going to need to do, it was really, really hard to do. It seems like they said the construction industry is broken. And you hear that all the time, the construction industry is broken. But but what if it isn't broken? What if it this is just the way it is? And and the, the, the way I the reason I ask that is because it seems to me that 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 there's always a bunch of different people who are trying to innovate around the construction industry in a variety of ways. But the innovations that have the most impact are usually smaller in scope than what Katerra was trying to take on. What, what, what's your perspective on that? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, the industry is broken. I don't think that's a necessarily good way of, of phrasing it. Uh, what I do think is true is that, you know, for the past 100 years or something like that, labor productivity in, in construction has, has basically gone nowhere. Um, it's, you know, houses essentially cost roughly the same that they did they do today than they did you know, 100 years ago, more or less. Um, and you compare it to something like agriculture, where in the 1800s you had, or the 1700s, you had, you know, 90% of people who were employed were employed in agriculture. And today that is 2%. So we see that in general, that we expect things to become more productive in time. We expect people to do more with less. We expect machines to be able to handle more of our tasks. And we expect things to become more and more and more accessible to people over time. And it's just has not happened with construction. And maybe that is just a fundamental law of the universe, but I don't believe that that's true. I think, you know, at some point there will be some sort of technology or process that comes along that is able to change how that's done that makes housing and buildings more accessible to people and less expensive to deliver. It's just a question of what that looks like and, and how we are, how far we are from it. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm hearing what you're saying that there there has to be from, from the people who are looking to innovate the industry, there has to be a lot of experimentation. I think the reason why Katera stands out so boldly is because it was such a huge experimentation and a real attempt to, to shift the entire industry. Yeah. And it's kind of a question of, you know, this is, I think that's a, a question that nobody has, has answered yet is that, do you need to change it all at once? You know, the construction industry is, is a little bit different is that there's so much regulation and there's so much local variation in things like, you know, in things like the site, each site is a little bit different and is is is, is going to be built in, in a slightly different way. But also things like local jurisdictions all have slightly different rules, so it's it's very difficult to sort of have an innovation that can spread. And so, is it you know, is it something that needs to be changed all at once uh, just because it's the only way to sort of implement a change, or is there some path forward to doing it as a more incremental thing where you start smaller and then scale up your solution? I, at the, at, you know, at the time I thought it was something that needed to be changed all at once, just because you had this big sort of interaction between jurisdictions and how the companies were set up and how that they made, how they made their money and what their risk profile was. I'm still not sure of that. Uh, it seems <laughs> like, you know, there's obviously a big risk in doing that and it makes it hard to sort of change your approach, but I think that's an unanswered question. It's interesting. Um, it seems like there there is three three fundamental shortcomings with with Katera. One being, like you said, the product market fit, and then then it's it's interesting as you as you look at the people who started the company. They they weren't construction insiders by by any means, and so they it seems like they had a, a combination of big dreams, but not really understanding construction in their bones. Uh, do you think I'm correct in that analysis? What do you think? I think that's true. I'm not sure how causal it is, or not not causal, but I'm not sure how much that matters. People people love to sort of, you know, take that as you know needing inside expertise. But you know, the founders of Uber and Lyft weren't taxi industry 
insiders, right? Right. I don't, it's 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 not not obvious from the outside what sort of knowledge that you need is required to have at the top and what isn't. And it obviously didn't work out in this case, but I'm not sure you can necessarily draw the conclusion that it has to come from somebody with deep inside knowledge. I'm, I'm you know, if, if you hire the right people and set the right vision and goals, it's not obvious to me that that's not enough. Okay. But, and, and that's one thing that they did, right? Is as Katera was growing, they, they went through a strategy of purchasing ver- a variety of different companies from architects, engineers, construction companies. So they, they brought in um, people like yourself, people who are industry veterans with it, that experience. How did that integration go of the, the, um, the folks who are outsiders with the folks that were insiders? What was that like? Yeah, I actually don't. That's, that's an interesting question. I, I, I didn't see a ton of, I would say, conflict necessarily between the insiders and the outsiders specifically. I would say there was kind of an issue where a lot of these acquisitions weren't necessarily integrated to one overall whole. There was a lot of them, but and there wasn't necessarily a, a, a concerted effort to sort of make sure that they were all working together and that the contractors were using the engineers as a resource and the, uh, you know, the architects and the, and the contractors were, were working together and they all, they all kind of continued to operate in, in some ways independently. And I think that, you know, made things more difficult than it, than it needed to be. That's interesting. Cause I think that that speaks then to their inability to, ge- to generate efficiencies through that vertical integration is the fact that some of the companies that were brought on um, instead of becoming part of Katera, so to speak, they still operated as independent entities. Am I hearing that right? With their own ways of doing things? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. D- yeah. I would say that's, yeah, they kind of operated independently and they weren't, you know, they weren't utilized. They weren't like involved in like, it wasn't one, you know, unified company effort where everybody was, was necessarily pushing on the, on the same thing. Uh, you know, an example is we had a, there was a renovations department that was, a, I think, an early acquisition. And we had a very, you know, just because of the way we hired in the engineering group, we had a lot of engineers that had a, a, a very large number of years of experience in doing renovation work. But we basically essentially never interacted with their group, even though it seems like an obvious synergy. Um, it just, you know, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, you know, there wasn't a impetus from the, from the top to kind of do that. And there wasn't an easy way to get that, to get that in place. It's interesting because even the most tightly integrated construction company, most cohesive construction company has tremendous conflicts within their own business all of the time anyway. And so I'm sure those things were compounded just because of, of both the scale, the size, the speed, and the complexity of what you guys are trying to do. Yeah, for sure. And, and I kind of talk about this in the article, but you know, it's, it's another thing that people love to point fingers at, but I'm sure anybody who works for a giant company can say all sorts of horror stories about how one division isn't playing nice to the other division yep. and this other division is trying to gain power for themselves. So they're trying to sideline this up, these other guys, you know, so it's, it's not necessarily super easy to separate what's, what's causal from the various challenges or what's just endemic to how a business of this size operates. Yeah, absolutely. So what did Katera get right in your in your view? I think the vertical integration was right. I think, you know, I'm not sure if the scale that they were operating at was was the right way to to do it. I'm not sure I'm not sure if 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 necessarily there's a huge advantage in being your old light light bulb supplier um as opposed to buying those products off the shelf. But I do think that being the builder and being the designer and being the manufacturer all in one, I think that's going to let you theoretically capture efficiencies and and benefits that if you were doing it separately wouldn't be possible. And and, and something that I didn't necessarily I don't think they necessarily got right, but I think was a correct attempt was really trying to just operate at very large scale, you know, trying to essentially operate over the entire country. And being able to like just push enough material through their factories where the sort of additional costs you get from from prefabrication from you know the logistics and the shipping of it are overcome by just your pure economies of scale where you're cranking out just thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of some building. I think that attempt, you know, I think that makes sense. Nobody has really been able to do that, but I think it makes sense to to try to do it. So so then let's let's explore that a little bit. If the vertical integration thesis was was the right perspective, the right path to go down. And and I don't think you'd get a tremendous amount of pushback in the industry ideally, but then you know there's always this gap between the ideal and the real. So if it was to happen all over again, um, knowing what you know now, if you were sitting down with someone who was saying, 
you know, I, I really want to start, Brian, I, I want to start something like Katera. What should I do that they didn't do? How would you approach that? Sure. I would start with just focused on like one specific product and just iterate that a lot you know, build a bunch of practice ones, uh, you know, eat the cost of it or find somebody willing to foot the bill, but build it and then learn from it and then build it again and have a really small core team that just iterates on that product initially. It could be a garden apartment. Uh, it could be a single family home. It could be something else. You know, the, obviously the larger you get, the harder to get, harder that, uh, harder that, that becomes. Um, but then, you know, really dial in something until you're really sure that you, you know, you have something that is really good that you can build really efficiently and that people want. And then once that's working, then you can, then you can scale it up. And I think something like that is possible, but I think it's very difficult. Yeah. It's interesting because when I talk with people who are, for instance, in the modular construction industry or in any kind of, any kind of big move in construction, and I ask who's going to drive this? Well, ultimately the people who drive it are going to be the people who are writing the checks for, you know, the, the product, the owners of, of the projects that are being built. So it's not so much, it seems construction driven by the companies that are building, but it's by the people who are purchasing the building, so to speak. Is, it, is that the right perspective, do you think? Um, maybe. I mean, there's that famous Henry, Henry Ford quote where he said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You know, it's, there, there, it's possible that like it's, it's going to be construction insiders that are going to be able to know or what's possible or even, again, outsiders who, are, who kind of can see a way of, of building things better and differently that people can't necessarily imagine but would love to 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 be able to to buy it if if it were available. So I don't I'm not sure if that's if that's true or not. So if you were to pick, and again, you know, we're not looking for like the right answer here, Brian. If you were to pick one product to to go after and then to iterate, just based on your experience of what you what you've seen could work, what product would you go after? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think kind of the 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 product that Katera was was working on and spent a lot of time developing was a was a cold form was a, a a garden apartment and initially it was made out of cold form steel. They ended up going back to uh, wood frame construction, but I think the you know, and there's a lot of challenges with, with the cold form steel one, but I think that has so many potential benefits in terms of manufacturability and, and optimization. It's looking, it's looking a little less good these days because I think the price of steel has really spiked. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think, I, again, I think it's, it's not like they had bad ideas or were working on the wrong things. I think that, you know, I think, uh, I think that has a, a lot of potential um, if you could you know, develop it in maybe a different way than Katera did. That's interesting. Um, why do you think Katera was so successful at, at attracting talented people to the industry and, you know, to come work for them? I, th I think there's a lot of sense in the industry from, from people like me and others that they're, you know, the way we're doing things, there's, you know, there's a, there's gotta be a, a, a better way of, of doing things the way that they are. I got, gosh, I wish somebody would try. And if you come along and you're a big, sexy Sil Silicon Valley startup with a giant war chest and, <laughs> you know, you can sell somebody that vision, right? You say, you know, the industry's broken. We're going to be the ones to fix it. Don't you want to come and be a part of that? That's a, re that's a really compelling uh, vision that you can offer to people. And not everyone was on board to do it, right? There's plenty of people that, that don't agree with that thesis, but enough people were that we, that, that, you know, in some ways it kind of sells itself. That's interesting. So um, as, as you reflect back on, on your time at Contero, what was your favorite part of um, working there? Oh, definitely the, the team that we're able to, to build and, and work with the sort of the team, the engineering team that we had in Atlanta was just amazingly strong. It was an amazing group of, of folks. And I really love the chance, the the ability to sort of work, build up that team and work with them and help and and help kind of try to push the company forward. It really meant a lot. And I, that's the one thing that I, uh, that I loved while I was doing there. That's neat. That's neat. And it seems that one of the reasons why they Katera ultimately failed, at least this iteration of it, is a combination of of scaling up too quickly, trying. It seemed like they were doing too much, too soon, too fast. All under the the premise that they had to do that in order to generate the economies of scale. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah. They definitely scaled up too. Yeah, to to a, a massive extent. They went from a thousand to I think eight thousand people in like a year. Which even for even for a startup, that's like a crazy rate of scaling. <laughs> um, and then yeah, they were trying to develop just a ton of products 
simultaneously. Yeah, I think a more focused, uh, a more focused effort um, that sort of had preceded that massive attempt to, to scale up would have perhaps been more fruitful. But you know, maybe that wouldn't have been enough to kind of you know change the industry all at once, and and maybe that's needed. So. Katera is not the first person to try to massively change the industry. They're not yep. even the first, they're not even the first the first people with massive funding to try to do it. <laughs> you know, they did they didn't fail because they failed in a very difficult problem. Uh, yes. that, that many other people have, have failed at as well. Yeah, it's interesting. So what I'm taking away from from what you're saying is that if you're going to try something like this vertical integration approach, you've got to narrow your focus as far as the product is concerned. You've got to get product market fit. You've got you've got to talk, get your customer. You you got to narrow down and make sure that you've you've nailed a customer. And then it sounds like you need enough money, not necessarily to scale, but to be able to take your time and iterate through the various versions of the product, so that you get to something that you can then replicate. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if <laughs> if uh, if I knew exactly what needed to be uh, to do to change the construction industry, I would, you know, I would be a very rich man. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my uh, that's kind of what I suspect is that, and that what that's what makes it so hard, right? Is that to just iterate? You know, it's one thing to iterate on like you know an electric you know, a piece of electronics that cost a hundred dollars or a piece of software or whatever. If you're trying to iterate in a building, which maybe cost $10 million to build, that's really hard to do, right? It's not easy. It's not easy to, to do it. And there's very few people that are going to be willing to sort of write a check for you to, to build eight different buildings until you find the way the, the night, the way that works. Right. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure if there's an easy answer to that. Yep. No, I, I totally appreciate that. Well, Brian, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Tell us a little bit more about how people can get in touch with you, how, how they can uh, find out more about what you do in terms of your thought leadership in the construction industry. Sure. I write a, a newsletter. It comes out weekly-ish, uh, and it's at uh, Construction Physics. Um, it can be found at constructionphysics.substack.com. Excellent. Excellent. We will link to that in the show notes. We'll also link to your, your LinkedIn profile. And I see, are you, are you there in Atlanta, Georgia? Yes. Excellent. Well, I, I like to ask my guests this. If someone is visiting Atlanta, what is the one restaurant they need to uh, the go to um, during their trip there? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a really uh, famous barbecue place, Fox Brothers Barbecue, that is very good. It's The line is always super long, but if you can get in, it's, it's very good. Fox Brothers Barbecue. Mm hmm We'll find that and uh, make sure that's in the show notes. So if you're in Atlanta, hit up Fox Brothers Barbecue. Brian, once again, thank you for uh, coming on the show. I'd like to get you back on because uh, you have a couple of things that you, I'd like to talk to you about the 3D printed buildings and also why it's so hard to innovate in construction. It'd be great to have you back on the show at some point. For sure. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Today's episode was brought to you by the Construction Conclave. If you as a construction leader would like to develop your skills and get involved in a community of like-minded construction professionals who are focused on building healthy teams, profitable projects, and long-term successful businesses, then the Construction Conclave is for you. It's a private invitation-only group of construction leaders that are focused on developing their leadership skills. We do training every single month online that looks at how to become a better leader in a very practical, straightforward way. We also have other events that build community and camaraderie so that you can associate with others who are interested in developing their skills as leaders. If you'd like more information and to see if you qualify for participating in the Conclave, feel free to reach out to me, eric at eric anderton.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes, share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit, and thanks again for listening.